hear me? Yep, good. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to come here and, and lecture on, on a topic I've been working on for, for many years now. Uh, this center is really, really great, and I, I think it's a great thing what you guys are doing by bringing different communities together. So let me begin by telling you, um, it's, it's a bit strange, right, because if you look at the, uh, um, the other lecturers are luminaries in the field, and then there's me. Uh, so I thought I should tell you a little bit about who I am. Who I am. So uh, I, I'm from Argentina. I studied uh, there and then uh, emigrated to the United States in 2000 due to the economic crisis um, with a, a football scholarship. Um, so uh, I was a goalkeeper uh, and I have broken every finger in my hands. Uh, so I, I know that, you know, uh, how to persevere, I guess. <laughs> Uh, when you break a finger and you're in the middle of a game, you just close your fist and you just keep on playing, right? So that's uh, a spirit I've also used in, in physics when uh, unavoidably I get stuck in some physics problem. So I came to the United States and I did, uh, I studied with Clifford Will at uh, Washington University. I studied post-Newtonian theory for the most part and experimental relativity there. Then I did my PhD at Penn State um, at uh, a place, uh, well, now it's called the Institute for Geometry and the Cosmos or something like that. Before it was called the Center for Geometry. And I worked with uh, Ash Takar on classical relativity, Owen and Finn on LIGO, and uh, Laguna, numerical relativity, and uh, Alexander on, on cosmology. And then from there, I moved on to Princeton and to Harvard with postdocs, then eventually became a professor um, at Montana State University, where we created a center and an institute for extreme gravity. And I am now moving very soon to the University of Illinois uh, to start a new institute for, for fundamental theory. Um, so I hope it's clear that I'm a physicist. <laughs> I'm not a mathematician. Uh, but I know, uh, so I talked to Paolo extensively about what it is that he wanted me uh, to lecture on. So my talks are, are, my, are gonna all be about black holes. And he asked me to concentrate on black holes in general relativity. I do a lot of work on black holes in modified theories from the point of view of trying to test or constrain these modified theories with observations. But uh, what I'm gonna concentrate here are black holes uh, in GR. And I'm gonna try to, since the audience is very mixed, I'm gonna try to uh, strike a balance between mathematical content and, and physics. Um, although, because my background is, is as a physicist, you'll see that most of my explanations are, are uh, physics first, uh, in a sense. Um, I will uh, always give a Blackboard talks for the remaining four talks, uh, and my handwriting is, uh, I'm gonna try real hard to make it clear, <laughs> but it's not the best, so I suggest that people are in the back. Uh, you're probably not gonna see anything, and there's an entire row of seats over here. Feel free to come down, uh, like now, if you want. Uh, this should be informal. You should feel free to ask me questions as I go, okay? Um, what else did I wanna say before starting? Um, let's see, I think that's pretty good. So let's, let's begin with, um, with uh, the syllabus. So, so I teach a class in, in, in the US uh, on, on black hole theory. It's like an entire semester, and I've tried to condense it into like four lectures, <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Uh, the topics I'm gonna cover, the syllabus if you want. So we're gonna start with uh, the Kerr black hole. That's gonna be uh, today's lecture. We're gonna talk about, uh, obviously I'm gonna define the metric in a few different coordinate systems. We're gonna talk about properties of this metric, and eventually we're gonna talk about geodesics, so the motion of a, of a test particle in this metric. Then tomorrow, I'll tell you a little bit about something called an EMRI, an extreme mass ratio in spiral. So this is when a small black hole gets captured by a supermassive black hole, and as the small black hole falls in, it zooms and whirls around the supermassive black hole generating gravitational waves. And these are waves that we hope to detect with the LISA mission in 2030. Problem is that it's mathematically very, very, very difficult uh, to solve for uh, the motion uh, to the right uh, accuracy and for the gravitational waves. So this is, uh, I'm gonna tell you where we are at more or less. 
but it's still an open problem. Uh, three, I'm going to talk about uh, comparable masks binaries. Comparable masks binaries. So here, we are, we are going to have in, uh, in mind are two black holes going around each other, typically in a quasi-circular orbit, uh, slowly in spiraling due to the emission of gravitational waves that LIGO has detected, for example, um, and Virgo. And uh, I'm going to tell you about the mathematical techniques that we use to model the motion of these two uh, black holes and the gravitational waves they emit. And then on the fourth lecture, I'm going to tell you a little bit about black hole perturbation theory. Um, so black hole perturbation theory, is, uh, here what we're trying to model is after a black hole um, captures or, uh, or after a, a small object falls into a black hole, then the black hole is perturbed and it needs to radiate its uh, excess information, its, its perturbations, and it does so through the emission of gravitational waves, and these gravitational waves follow a quasi-normal spectrum. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how one calculates that, uh, in probably in Schwarzschild, because we won't have time to, to do Kerr. Okay, so that's the plan for the next four days. Uh, and then I go back to the US and get on a truck and move to Illinois. So let's begin with, uh, Oh, and obviously, uh, if this is an axis uh, labeling difficulty, easy is here, hard is here. So we're going to start like sort of basic. Uh, I know there's a lot of experts in the audience that are already probably going to know half of what I'm going to say. Just bear with me. Um, you know, if you already know this stuff, this is not ready for you. So curve black holes. So I always like to start when I lecture on this. Uh, with a quote by uh, Chandrasekhar, who said, if you want to be a good physicist, you've got to know your field or the history of your field. Okay, so let's start with a history, uh, a very uh, lightning description of the history. 1916, Schwarzschild finds the first... Uh, well, the spherically symmetric solution to the Einstein equations. The equations had been published uh, in 1915, at the end of 1915, um, early in 1916. And so he finds the Schwarzschild solution, obviously. Between 1922 and 1926, there's a work by Friedman and a bunch of other people, Lemaitre and so on, uh, working on cosmological solutions, so solutions to Einstein equations that have, uh, uh, well, that represent a uh, homogeneous and an isotropic universe and their expansion. 1930, or in the 30s, it's a work by Oppenheimer, later followed uh, of, uh, or with Snyder, and the, what they were looking here is the collapse of, of, of matter distributions and what the end state of that collapse would be. Because, you know, just because you have these solutions don't, don't, re, don't necessarily mean that those solutions are representative of something that happens in nature. So what you have to understand is, are those solutions the end state of gravitational collapse, and how generic can you make that statement? Um, then, uh, pretty much little happens between 39 and 45, for obvious reasons. Uh, so I'm going to put unhappy face here. Um, 1960s, after the war, uh, a bunch of things starts happen, uh, start happening, more or less all at the same time. So you have, I'm going to write over here, 1960s. 60s were good. <laughs> were good because... Not just because that's the, the year the house I bought in Illinois was built, but also because um, there were new telescopes that were coming online. And those new telescopes led to new discoveries, new observations that were not really explainable um, with the status quo. Then on top of that, there were new differential geometrical results. Um, and there were a lot more scientists who were sort of interested in investigating both general relativity and these new uh, observations 
that were happening. And so sometimes, um, and, and this is, imp oh, by the way, so this is sort of because of the end of the nuclear era. So, so, so we're talking about, you know, a lot of scientists moving away from, uh, you know, work that they were doing in the, you know, 40s related to, to nuclear physics and trying to look at other problems, new problems that were hot at that time. And so they started investigating this, these ideas. And this has led uh, to what some people call the golden age of GR. And it was pretty cool because it was called the golden age, I guess, because there were a lot of results that were coming up like pretty much at the same time by people that uh, are, you know, are the founding fathers, if you want, and mothers of, of the field. In Princeton, you had Wheeler. In Cambridge, and this is an incomplete list. Huh? Cambridge, you had Penrose. And you have Chiama. You have Carter, floating around. Uh, in Moscow, the Russian group, you had Soldovich. which I think received a medal from ICTP, right? Um, in Hamburg, you had Jordan, and you had Ellers. And finally, in Texas, you had Shield and Boyer, and Kerr. <laughs> yep. There goes the picture. Okay. And in 63, using uh, mathematical techniques, Kerr comes up with a, with a solution uh, to the Einstein equations that um, later, through the work of, of Newman, uh, was interpreted as the, as the solution representing a spinning black hole. So it was, the solution was uh, axisymmetric. But it had some very interesting mathematical properties. Um, and together with uh, Newman, so you had the work of Carter that essentially led to an, uh, a physical interpretation, if you want, of this result. So the interpretation here comes in around 64. Okay, so after the 60s, there's a bit of a hiatus in, in the history. I'm gonna sort of stop here in the history, I'm just gonna tell you in words. Uh, in the 70s and the 80s, there's an explosion of uh, particle physics. Uh, there's a lot of new particle physics results, new particles, left and right, standard models and all of that. And there's a dearth of data um, to really verify some of the predictions of, of general relativity. You were making uh, experiments left and right in the solar system, but you know, solar system gravitational fields very weak, the velocities are very small relative to the speed of light, so the gravitational fields are not strong, so it's hard to actually test some of the more uh, dramatic uh, predictions of general relativity. It was not until um, really the discovery of the binary pulsar in the 80s uh, and the detection of that these two neutron stars, well, actually, <laughs> the neutrons are on a white dwarf, but you, know, you have one neutron star that's rotating very fast and it's producing uh, its spin axis, it's misaligned with its magnetic axis, so light goes out through its magnetic axis, and so this magnetic axis, since the star is, so I'm the star and I'm spinning about this axis and my magnetic axis is over here, so as I spin, I just go like this, and so every time I go by you, you detect a pulse of radiation of, of in the radio. And that's, that thing was called a pulsar. Um, and the, the pulsars had been discovered prior to the 80s, but the discovery of a very tight pulsar in orbit around a white dwarf allowed people to measure the orbit very precisely and discover that the period of this binary system was shrinking. And this uh, shrinkage of the period of the binary system coincided pr precisely with the predictions of general relativity of how much a period should be changing due to the emission of gravitational waves by, by such a compact binary. 
Uh, that eventually led House and Taylor to the Nobel Prize in 83, 4, something like that. Um, and then we have to like sort of fast track another uh, 30 years before we have like the next direct detection of gravitational waves uh, with LIGO. And a tremendous amount of theoretical work had to be done in order for, for that discovery. Of course, also experimental work, because you, know, you had to build these gigantic machines, uh, bounce lasers, create this interferometer, get the data. But you, the data was, uh, that was obtained uh, was actually quite uh, buried in the noise. And the interpretation of the data required theoretical models. And those theoretical models required a solution to the Einstein equations. Uh, so a lot of physicists spend a lot of time trying to solve uh, these problems that I'm going to describe here. Um, and the one that LIGO detected first was uh, the solution for a comparable mass binary. Okay, so that's sort of the context. Let's now start with uh, the metric. Um, so a lot of what I'm gonna be describing in terms of the metric can be found in, in a variety of books from uh, MTW, so references. So Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, um, who recently updated, I think Kip recently updated his book. There's a book by Wald, of course. I think Bob will be lecturing here later. So if you have any questions about what I said, you can always ask Bob, <laughs> <laughs> chapter seven or eight of his book. Um, there's also a book by Sean Carroll that's pretty nice. Uh, but the book I'm going to be following is a book by, well, following. A lot of the material I'm going to be uh, describing is in a book by Eric Poisson uh, called The Relativist Toolkit. And it's a very handy, thin book. And there's others, of course. Dot, 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 dot. Okay, so let's begin with a metric. So uh, for a curve like called the line element, it's described or can be described following expression. So I'm using a signature that's minus plus 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 because that's the right signature and you can't convince me that that's not the right signature. It's minus one minus two m r over rho squared dt square minus four m a r divided by rho squared sine squared theta times dt d phi. This term is off diagonal in this coordinate system it's called the gravitomagnetic term. It plays the role of a magnetic field in gravity. Sigma over rho square. I'll define all the symbols in a second, okay? Sine square theta, d phi square, plus rho square over delta, dr square. This term is really cool. Plus rho square, d theta square. That term's boring. So that's the line element in all its full gory detail in what's called boyer lindquist Make it bigger, I can definitely make it bigger. This is why I said people need to sit in the front. <laughs> this is boyer lindquist I'll write the next equations bigger, okay? So, so rho square is defined to be r square plus a square cos square theta. Delta is defined to be r squared minus 2mr plus a square. And sigma is defined to be r squared plus a squared squared minus a squared delta sine squared theta. Okay. This is not the only coordinate system in which we can write the metric, uh, even though it is the most common coordinate system used. And for most of what I'm gonna be talking next, I'm going to be using this coordinate system. I'm gonna tell you what that M means and what that A means in a second. Um, and uh, before proceeding, however, I think it's useful to present two other uh, versions of this metric in other coordinate systems that are very useful and are used a lot. Um, for example, I was just at the GR relativity meeting, the um, international meeting in Valencia, and a professor for, from India, his name I can't quite remember right now, was talking about solutions uh, for um, 
in the large D limit, because that turns out to have interpretations in, in, a, in a fluid gravity type duality. And he was using the Kerr metric, but in a different coordinate system that he didn't, at the time of, of, of working on this, he, he didn't really know according to his talk. So I'm gonna show it to you here, because it's very useful. We use it all the time in relativity. Um, but before we go there, we need to talk about the ingoing Kerr coordinates. There's two versions of these coordinates, ingoing and outgoing. And so ingoing Kerr coordinates are defined through V equal uh, Boyer-Linquist T plus this R star. The R star is called the tortoise coordinate, which is given by this expression. Okay. And then psi is phi plus r uh, numeral, and r numeral is equal integral of a over delta dr. And so these coordinates are useful just like they're useful in Schwarzschild. Um, in Schwarzschild, um, your regular Schwarzschild coordinates just sort of become um, bad as you approach the, the horizon. So you need to go into penetrating, horizon penetrating coordinates. This is a set of horizon penetrating coordinates that are actually adapted to the null congruences of your space time. And the line element, now written bigger, in these coordinates become this, becomes this. So minus one minus two MR over rho squared DV squared. Now there's this off diagonal term DV DR, and just with a number two, no function there. Then you have the angular part, what I would call earlier the magnetic piece. That's two a sine square theta, dr d psi. And then you have two other terms, well, three other terms that arise due to this transformation. One, it's a mixing term. Um, dv d psi. 4ma over rho square r sine square dv d psi. And then you have two more terms, plus sigma over rho square sine square theta uh, d psi square and rho square d theta square, okay? That's what the line element looks like. These coordinates are much better behaved across the horizon, so a lot of people investigate them uh, or use them to investigate solutions. Um, and finally, there's the coordinates that were being used in this large D expansion, which are called Kirchhoff coordinates. Now, Kirchhoff coordinates um, are related to ingoing uh, Kerr coordinates through this transformation. Okay. So x plus i y equals r plus uh, i a sine theta e to the i psi. Z is equal to R cosine theta, and T prime is equal to V minus R. These coordinates are real, so the Kirchhoff coordinates are X, Y, Z, T. The ingoing Kerr coordinates are uh, V, Psi, R, and theta. So, on, so here are the maps. Uh, and this equation, when I first saw it as a grad student, I was sort of confused, like, wait, like, wouldn't this make the metric complex? And no, what it's meant here is that, obviously, you're supposed to match the real part with the real parts. Um, make a mistake here? I did. Parenthesis there. 
apologize. So, for example, if you expand this out, this is uh, cosine psi plus i sine psi, and you carry out the product, and there's going to be a real part to that product, and that's supposed to be equal to x, and then the purely imaginary part is supposed to be equal to y. Okay? In this coordinate system, magic happens, and the line element is Minkowski. plus a function h times a covector L alpha, a one form, dx alpha, dx beta, where h is defined to be 2m r over rho squared, and L alpha d alpha is too big to be written over there, so I'm going to write it over here. R squared plus A squared over delta dt minus dr plus A over delta um, d phi. This is written in boyer linquist coordinates, so you have to transform if you want it in Kirchhoff. All right, so it's very nice because it looks like just Minkowski. Oh, so I didn't say this, but alpha Greek letters range from zero to three because that's what we do. Um, I guess when Bob talks, then his Latin letters are going to range from zero to three. Anyway, in this case, alpha and beta Greek letters range from zero to three. You're supposed to understand it that way. Okay, so that's the line element. Very nice because it looks like Minkowski, and then you have this correction that's like a conformal factor, sort of, times times this, this, this extra piece, okay? And these are three fairly common coordinate systems that people use. And they become very useful when you're trying to study solutions uh, to the Einstein equations or properties uh, of the car metric. Okay, are there any questions so far? Apart from the fact that I write too small and I to write bigger? Yes? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I couldn't understand your last part. So you have yeah, yeah. Why is the why is the mixed term? Yeah. Why is the mixed term there? Yeah. So why shouldn't it be a What? No. So there is there's a dr square term here. There's a d theta square, d phi square, d t square, and then a cross term. This is the T D phi. Sorry, yeah. Let me also tell you that if you try to put a generic ansatz, like some function of T and theta in the T component, T T component, some function of T and theta in the T phi component, some function of T and theta in the phi phi component, some function of T and theta in the R R component, and some function of T and theta in your theta theta component. And you throw that into Maple and you ask, Maple, find me the solution. Maple says, no, I will instead crash your computer. Uh, at least as of like 10 years ago when I tried as a grad student. Um, the, the equations are, the answer equations, if you put in like four arbitrary uh, functions or five arbitrary functions, are very, very complicated. They're coupled, they're nonlinear, and even modern uh, symbolic manipulation software has trouble, um, has trouble solving it. Of course, if you hold the, the hand of the computer a little bit and you, you use some of the properties that you expect this metric to have, then, then it can do it. But just brute force approach, throw it on a computer and let the computer find the solution does not work. <laughs> At least it didn't as of 10 years ago. Okay. 
So let's talk about properties a little bit. That was the metric. This is properties. Okay, so there's many ways in which to discuss properties, but I'm going to just list a few here that should be obvious. Uh, the metric is asymptotically flat. Meaning as you t do an expansion about I0, so about R goes to infinity, you recover Minkowski. Um, the metric is stationary, but not static. Um, yes. That's a good question. So, yes, I can. So the question is, are these uh, solutions that I wrote down here defined in the same domain of your space time, or are they restricted to different parts of the domain? This goes toward the uh, topic of the maximal extension of of the Kerr metric, where you have uh, charts that can actually cover all of the domain. So, uh, no, the answer is no. They're not uh, well-defined uh, in the same domains. In fact, as you would expect, the boyer linquist metric becomes ill-defined at the horizon, so connecting region one with region two in your Penrose diagram becomes problematic. Um, you obviously can like, look at the solution in, in region two, but those two are not connected. So the idea of going to ingoing Kerr coordinates is that you can then connect region uh, one to region two. Um, and the same with Kerr shield coordinates, which is like a simple rewriting. If you want the maximal extension, you have to go to something like pine levee gustar coordinates, but adapted to a Kerr metric, so that you can then connect to the different uh, regions. Uh, and the, the maximal extension is, is very interesting. Uh, not entirely clear it's physical, <laughs> but it's very interesting. Um, and you know you can find it in detail in Poisson's book or in MTW, but I'm not gonna go into too much more detail. I'm gonna, I'm gonna concentrate for like the rest of like my lectures on what we would call region one, which is like where observers live and I can make measurements. Um, don't all expressions are valid in region one. Yeah, so this is a region that actually has access to I naught, and it has access all the way up to the horizon. And sometimes, like when I'm doing calculations, I'm gonna need to like have the coordinates are well defined on the horizon, so then I'm gonna switch to one of these two. Uh, excellent question, yeah. If that didn't make sense, just go la la la, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so what I was saying is that the metric is stationary but not static in the sense that it's time independent, but it's not invariant under T reversal. It's not invariant under T reversal because there's this term here, okay, the T D phi. And you would expect that the metric of a rotating black hole not be symmetric under time reversal because if I flip the sign of time and I just start going backwards, then the black hole would be spinning in the opposite direction it was spinning before. So physically, it shouldn't be time symmetric. Um, then there's some peculiar parameters that appear here, M and A, okay? Um, don't have time to prove this, that's why I have a one semester class on this topic, but M turns out to be the ADM mass. It also turns out to be the Comer mass. It also turns out to be what we sometimes call the Newtonian mass, i.e. it's the mass of the object. Um, it's the ADM mass in the sense that it's the total mass energy of your space time. You can define this um, through an integral that you can then convert into a boundary uh, integral, a surface integral. Um, the, it turns out you can prove, I, I think, that for stationary space time, the Comer mass is the same as the ADM mass. There's another expression for the Comer mass in terms of killing vectors of your metric. And the Newtonian mass, this is a more experimental term. It's the mass you would measure as an experimentalist if you were watching the motion of, say, a planet around this compact object. It's the mass that enters like the acceleration term, the Newtonian acceleration if you do a far field expansion. A turns out to be the um, ADM angular momentum 
divided by the ADM mass, and it's sometimes called the Kerr spin parameter. Not to be confused with the Kerr spin angular momentum, but we are sometimes sloppy in physics, and we call the Kerr spin both A and J, depending on, on context. Um, the A parameter, for reasons that are going to become obvious, is bounded between is bounded between one and minus one. So there's a regime of uh, well, you know, you you can you you can use this solution. I mean, you can investigate what happens if A over mass ADM, just say mass here, is larger than one. Like there's nothing wrong, obviously wrong, that happens to the metric here if I just pick A to be 1.1. But then if you look at it more carefully, as I'm gonna try to show you next, then problems arise, okay, that I will describe. Um, what else? Oh, there I should say that there's killing vectors and killing tensors in this spacetime. Uh, as you would expect, there is a time-like killing vector. So d, say, x alpha dt, and then there's an azimuthal killing vector, say, d, x alpha d phi, where phi here is supposed to be the angle uh, about the rotation axis, and I'm working here in, uh, in boyer lindquist coordinates, but you can sort of see that this has to be the case because the metric is stationary, so there should be a killing vector associated with, with that with that symmetry. And the metric is also axisymmetric about the z-axis, about, uh, about the angle phi. So there has to be an azimuthal killing vector. And then there turns out to also be um, another object that I'm not gonna write down right now, but I'm gonna tell you that it exists. Okay, alpha beta, that's a killing tensor, so it satisfies the killing tensor equations for this space time. So that's sort of like a little bit like a, like a hidden symmetry of this metric. It's not directly associated, as far as I know, to any obvious symmetry like this. But it does lead to a conserved quantity. Um, and that fact is very, very important for, for doing physics and understanding orbits. Um, so let's continue with, with a few more properties. And you know, we could do this in a purely mathematical way, but you know, since my role here is to stretch your physics brains, we're gonna discuss properties from a more physical standpoint, and we're gonna talk about observers. So there's a class of, well, there's a few classes of special observers that allow us to understand the physics of metrics Capital what, sorry? X alpha, this is just the coordinates in your, in your chart. No, it could be anything. So it could be like T, R, theta, and phi. Uh, it could be uh, V, R, theta, and psi. It could be X, Y, Z, and T. Or sorry, T, X, Y, and Z. <laughs> yeah. Yes? This inequality? Yeah, yeah, so M, M in principle can be anything. This inequality, yeah, this inequality says that A over M is bounded between one and minus one. A has to have units of. So, so J over M is A, but as I'm gonna show you in a second, A has units of mass or energy. I erased it, unfortunately. Uh, but you can see that from the metric. See? Yeah, you're good? Okay. Um, oh, what is this symbol here? This is K alpha beta. So the question is what was this symbol? K alpha beta is a killing tensor. So it, it satisfies the killing equations. So. Ah, okay, <laughs> good, okay. So a killing tensor is, a, is, an, 
it's an object that satisfies a differential equation that looks of the form like this. Okay, alpha beta is semicolon gamma, where, no, there, uh, equal zero, symmetrized. It's not my notes, so I'm like now just trying to remember. <laughs> it's similar to a killing vector, but it's a generalization to higher rank. So if you want a killing vector, it's a rank one killing tensor, and uh, the one I wrote here is a rank two killing tensor, and there can be higher rank killing tensors. And it turns out that you can show that quantities constructed from the cons contraction of any killing tensor with the four velocity of a particle are conserved under time evolution. So for example, killing vector contracted onto the four velocity is a scalar, and that scalar is conserved, like if you take d by d tau of that quantity, tau being proper time associated with, um, with the geodesic, whose four velocity you just use to contract this thing, you can show that that scalar is conserved. In the case of T, like if you contract it with a four velocity, you would get the energy. Here, if you contract phi with a four velocity, you would get the angular momentum. Here, if I take K alpha beta and I contract it with U alpha U beta, I get another conserved quantity that, that is also a scalar and that we're gonna use later to, to decouple the equations. Good, good question. Um, also, it's impossible to like be completely comprehensive and thorough in, in the amount of time I have. I'm gonna throw some words here and I'm gonna present some results and I really encourage you to come and ask me later or look up some of these words in the references that I, I presented, okay. Um, so I was talking about special observers. One of them, called the ZAMO, okay, ZAMO is a zero angular momentum observer. that, you know, it's supposed to be rotating with the black hole. So what do I mean by an observer? Uh, when we say observer in physics, what we mean is, imagine that you have a test particle that does not really affect the background, and it's just sort of like sitting there observing what happens to this, uh, to itself, okay? Um, and so, it is in that sense I'm using the word observer, and a zero angular momentum observer is supposed to be something that rotates with a black hole, so typically it's defined through a four velocity, so this is a, U alpha is the four velocity of this observer, uh, such that the quantity L tilde, defined as the contraction of the four velocity with phi alpha, where phi alpha is the killing vector over here, is equal to zero. So it's an observer that essentially measures zero angular momentum. Now, if you go and work out uh, this contraction, I'm using the Einstein summation convention as, as usual, then you find, uh, and remember that this U alpha here, you know, if you have some trajectory, Z alpha, uh, then U alpha is the tangent to that trajectory, and tau is the can be any affine parameter on that geodesic, but I'm using proper time because I'm always thinking of, of massive particles, okay? So, um, if you expand this out because of the form of this quantity and the form of the metric, you get that L tilde is equal to G T phi times T dot, where the dot stands for proper time derivative, plus G phi phi times phi dot. Okay? Uh, and you want this to be zero, which then means that uh, phi dot divided by t dot, which is also known as, I'm sorry mathematicians, you're gonna not like this, but we call this the phi dt in physics. Okay. And we define it to be an angular velocity omega, which is nothing but just the ratio of minus 
the component of the metric G phi phi, sorry, G T phi, with the component of the metric G phi phi. Okay? And you can work this out. You can find that omega is equal to 4 m a r divided by sigma. Okay? So it goes in the far field limit. As r goes to infinity, you can do a Taylor expansion about i naught, and you find that this thing here, this omega, goes to uh, roughly the spin angular momentum of the black hole, so j divided by um, r cubed in this case. Um, so a few properties of this thing. This omega thing is the angular velocity of this observer. It gets sort of larger and larger and larger as, you upload, as you're approaching the horizon um, until it gets to some sort of critical value at the horizon. This omega is um, sort of in the same direction as the spin angular momentum of the black hole, as I defined it here. And um, if you take the limit as r goes to the horizon of the black hole, you, what you end up getting is the angular velocity of the horizon of the black hole, which is an interesting quantity for a variety of reasons. Okay, so that's what people refer to as a ZAMO. And that's important because of two additional observers that people like to talk about that sort of reveal the properties of the Kerr spacetime. One is the observer called the static observer, and the other one is the observer called the stationary observer. So let's talk about the static observer. Is there a question? Yes. Oh, excuse me, I can't hear you. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're right. Just seeing if you guys were paying attention. <laughs> um, was there a question? Maybe later? Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about the second class of special observers called static observers. So static observers are those with four velocity, u alpha, equal to some proportionality factor gamma or normalization factor gamma times T alpha, where T alpha is supposed to be the killing vector associated with uh, stationarity. Um, so in some sense, these are observers that are sort of not moving in space time. They're sort of held there. So uh, you should imagine the observer being in some sort of spacecraft, being sort of attached to that point in in space, but just moving in time only. So gamma here has to be normalized. So if you're using a, a normalization in my signature to be minus 1, then this implies that gamma has to be equal to the time-time component of the metric to the minus 1 half. So I say here, these are observers that are uh, sort of held in place. That's the physical, the physical picture you should have in mind. But something sort of curious happens because gamma doesn't really exist everywhere in your, in your, in your domain, right? There's a point or a set of points in your domain where gamma goes to zero. Sorry, GTT goes to zero. So gamma diverges. So static observers do not exist. Always forget how to write these things. Exist uh, if GTT is equal to zero, which is equivalent to saying 
at a position R of theta that is equal to M plus M one minus A squared over M squared cosine squared theta to the one half. So whenever you get to this particular uh, point or set of points, then static observers do not exist, which means observers have to actually move in space. They're being forced to move in space. You can't keep them there, no matter how strong your spaceship engines are, okay? This thing, this place where you cannot remain still is called the ergosphere. Okay? So, When GTT is equal to zero, then the static observer zone exists because gamma diverges, and GTT is equal to zero, you can solve for what that is, because I wrote down what GTT was in boyer linquist coordinates, and it gives you this solution. Okay. So, yes, yes, of course. Yeah, I wasn't reading, actually. <laughs> I'm just like saying it. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So I was gonna go more into, into that. So, so let's, let's make a drawing. I like to make drawing. Can you see if I draw down here or is it like too low because of the, t no, you, you can see, okay. So imagine that, you know, I draw the black hole. Um, I'm gonna late, later show you that there's an event horizon just like in Schwarzschild, but it's not quite just as in Schwarzschild. It's different than Schwarzschild, but there's still a horizon. And so let me draw the horizon here. I'm gonna challenge my skills of drawing a circle. Ah, failed. I always tell my students before they defend their thesis, just practice making a circle before the oral defense. That's supposed to be a circle, and that's supposed to be the event horizon, which I'm gonna tell you about later. The, turns out the ergosphere is sort of oblate like this. Ah. It's like an ellipsoid, okay, of revolution. Um, and what this is saying is, you know, if, if I am here in green, if I am in this like little rocket here, that's my rocket, and okay. I, I have engines that are powerful enough to just like keep me there, and I can take all the pictures of the black hole I want, and life is good. I can like even observe it with like telescopes. And if I get closer, I can still do that. But eventually, if I get here, if I, no matter how much I try to turn my rockets up, I am not able to just stay in place. And what's actually gonna happen is that I'm going to begin to rotate with a black hole. So I'm gonna rotate because the, the space-time fabric itself is rotating so strongly that inertial frames begin to rotate. So this is a manifestation of what we would call in the weak field the dragging of inertial frames, but like cranked up to like a million. I'm talking about massive particles uh, here, yeah. Uh, for photons, there's a slightly different limit. Let's talk about that later. <laughs> uh, I don't, actually, I don't think I was gonna talk about the photon sphere, but we can if you want to. Um, so, all right, so I have one more observer that I wanted to discuss with you, which is the stationary observer. So the stationary observer, Stationary observer is an observer with a four velocity at some constant times T alpha plus omega times 
phi alpha. Where omega here is the same omega I wrote down over there, it's d phi dt. Um, but it's, it's sort of the angular velocity of the, of the, so it's not the same omega, ah, god darn it. Call this omega bar here. So omega bar is some d phi dt of the observer. Omega bar d phi dt of stationary observer. And just as before, um, there's a normalization condition gamma. You require u alpha u alpha to be equal to minus one. And you can solve for what gamma is. Gamma is equal to g phi phi to the minus one half times two, I'm gonna define what little omega is in a second, big omega bar minus omega bar square minus gtt over g phi phi. So little omega here, I've defined it to be minus gt phi over g phi phi. So I suppose is the same as the capital omega that appears here. I'm using a different symbol here just so that we don't get confused with the omega and the omega bar. Okay. Um, great, so just like before, there is some point or set of points in space time where stationary observers cannot exist because um, this quantity here diverges. So if gamma, let's say gamma to the minus two is equal to zero, then there does not exist stationary observers. And so you can show that this happens for omega bars that are between some omega minus. So if, if omega bar is between omega minus and omega plus, then everything is fine, then okay, <laughs> essentially, okay? So if, 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 you, if, you, if you crank up your angular velocity enough, then these stationary observers can exist. And so let me plot for you omega bar as a function of say r over m is a tricky uh, result. Omega plus minus here, by the way, is given by the expression uh, little omega plus minus delta to the one half rho squared over sigma sine theta. I mean, you can see that this is just the solution to this quadratic equation for gamma bar. Because when this thing goes to zero, uh, then you're gonna have problems. So um, if I plot omega plus, it looks something like this. If I plot omega minus, it looks something like this. And then at some r, they touch, oops. They touch like right here, okay? So at that point, omega plus is equal to omega minus. And let me denote this point here where they touch as r sub h. Just for kicks, our ergosphere is here. So what this is saying is that as long as your angular velocity omega bar is somewhere in between these two curves, this one remember is omega plus and this one is omega minus, okay, then you're fine. You can, you have a, 
uh, you can have stationary observers. But eventually, they meet, and beyond that point, you can have stationary observers any longer. Okay, so then the question is, what is this RH? I guess I could put it over there. So recall that RH is when, or is defined by the condition that omega plus is equal to omega minus. And if you look at that, this is the expression for omega plus minus. These two angular velocities or critical velocities are going to be the same when this uh, discriminant vanishes. Uh, rho can not vanish because it's r squared plus a squared cosine squared, so it's a sum of two terms that are square, so they're both positive individually. Uh, but delta can vanish. So this implies that delta has to be zero, and if you solve for delta being equal to zero, you get that rh is equal to m uh, plus um, m one minus a squared over m squared to the one half. That's right. Is that right? Well, I slightly lied. There's two solutions to this. There's an R plus and there's an R minus because there's a plus minus here because delta equals zero is a quadratic equation for R. RH is equal to R plus. And R minus, um, sorry, and R minus, so, and this thing is going to be called the event horizon. I'm going to explain to you in a second why this is called the event horizon. R minus is another horizon that I'm not going to go into detail here, which is closer to the singularity than R plus, so R plus is the outermost horizon. Um, this goes back to the causal structure of Kerr and the maximal extension and things like that, which I'm not going to get into because I like to stay outside of the horizon. But just know that in Kerr, there are multiple horizons that arise and they all have very interesting mathematical properties. Um, so how do we know that this is our horizon? Well, um, Turns out, if you say that f is equal to um, r minus, say, rh, and you consider the surface f is equal to zero, then this surface is null, and you can show that the normal to that surface is also null, and more also, you can show that um, the null expansion, which I'm going to call theta, so the null expansion of a congruence of geodesics, if you know what that means, vanishes at Rh. So that's a, that's a statement about there not being any uh, outgoing null geodesics um, that are time-like, that are being emitted by the horizon, okay? So if you look at bundles of null rays, then these null rays become null on this surface. It's very much like what we do when we prove that there's an event horizon in Schwarzschild, the light cones. Do you remember this picture of the light cones, maybe? The light cones sort of like tilting until they become sort of null when you get to the horizon. It's the same idea, but just done mathematically slightly more formally. So f is a function that I'm defining to be r minus rh, and when f is equal to zero, that defines a surface, r equal constant on your spacetime. That surface, you can prove, is a null surface, and, and you can prove that it, the, the, the normals to that surface are also null, okay? And so that's just a mathematical statement. You can also show that the expansion, so how, 
so if you look at two nearby geodesics in a bundle, and you can ask, you know, as I move forward in time, how, how much do they separate? Okay, that's like the expansion of, of, of geodesics. And now imagine that these geodesics are now rays. Okay, you can show that this expansion actually vanishes on the horizon, which is a, a, the definition of something called an apparent horizon. So, yep. Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? Sorry. So, uh, the ratio between R minus and yes. is something like. Uh, oh, that's the, uh, the, the, the character of the yeah, geodesic yeah. switch. Yeah, so it switches and then it switches again after you cross yeah. R minus. That, that's correct. Um, but again, we're not going to go there because I want to talk about other topics. But yeah, that's a good point. Um, so how do we know that this is a black hole? So far I've told you that there are special observers. I told you that there's this magical, wonderful place called the ergosphere, where if you try to stay fixed in space, you can't and just rotate, which is weird because we don't have that in Schwarzschild. I've also told you that there is a place called the horizon. Um, and you know, at the horizon, that's the last point where there can be stationary observers, meaning if I'm inside of the event horizon, I am not going to be stationary anymore. And in fact, you can show that geodesics will focus inside of the horizon and they will focus toward a point that I'm gonna describe in a second. What I have not showed you yet is that this is a singular space-time that has a, a singularity essentially uh, in it just like Schwarzschild has a singularity. And remember, this is general relativity, so I cannot just look at the metric and be like, oh, this metric component diverges here, so therefore this must mean that the, there is a singularity. Like, that's not enough, because I can always maybe go to a different coordinate system that's more regular. So what I have to do is you have to calculate curvature invariance. So is this a black hole? So you calculate, any, any invariant will do. I'm gonna show you my favorite one, which is the Kretschmann. There's many curvature invariants you can calculate. This one is constructed from the Riemann tensor like so. Oopsies. Um, by the way, I can't construct a curvature invariant with a Ricci scalar because obviously it's a vacuum solution of the Einstein equation, so the Ricci scalar and the Ricci tensor all vanish. Um, so the only thing that I can do is construct invariance with, um, with a Riemann tensor. And the Riemann tensor does not vanish, which is a good sign that this is not Minkowski <laughs> in disguise. Better not be Minkowski. So the Kretschmann is 48 m squared over rho to the 12 times r squared minus a squared cosine squared theta times rho to the four minus 16 a squared r squared cosine squared theta. We look, looks wonderful because it's obviously not zero, like things are not zero. Moreover, it is something that when you take the limit a goes to zero, recovers the Kretschmann scalar for Schwarzschild in Schwarzschild coordinates, so you know that like, well, at least this metric has something to do with Schwarzschild, not just because the line elements more or less look alike. And on top of that, it looks like something that has the chance of diverging when rho vanishes. And if you remember the definition of rho, rho was r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta. And so this rho is equal to zero occurs Rho square. Is that what I mean? Yeah, thank you. Um, this occurs when r is equal to zero and, and when theta is equal to pi over two. That's different from Schwarzschild. You see, in Schwarzschild, the Kretschmann scalar diverges when the Schwarzschild coordinate r goes to zero. Here, the Kretschmann scalar diverges 
provided I am on the equatorial plane. Remember, theta is the angle that points from the pole, which is the axis of rotation, down, right? And theta is equal to zero for physicists means the pole. <laughs> theta is equal to pi over two means the equatorial plane. So that's a little bit weird. So here's where we go and we use Kirchhill coordinates. We transform, 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 you do the same calculation. And you can, have, in fact, show very easily that x squared plus y squared equals r squared plus a squared sine squared theta. And that z, remember, was defined as r cosine theta. So r is equal to 0 and theta is equal to pi is the condition x squared plus y squared is equal to a squared, and z is equal to zero, I think. Yes. Right? And that's the equation of a, everyone together? A ring on the equatorial plane, right? So there's a ring on the equatorial plane of this object of radius A, where you have a curvature singularity. And that's interesting because that means that I can go through the middle of the ring and the curvature does not technically diverge. Okay, so what you used to have as a point curvature singularity has sort of somehow spread into this ring structure. Okay, so how much more time do I, am I done? Five minutes, okay. Good. Five minutes. Let's do all of geodesics in five minutes. This sounds, we can do it. Unless there's a question, in which case we'll just answer the question. <laughs> uh, your map is the ring. Yes. It's a ring in Kirchhill coordinates. Yes, very good. Uh, yeah, so you can go to ellipsoidal type coordinates where, where the shape would look perhaps a little bit different, but, but it is, yes. So it is a coordinate dependent statement. So in, in boyer linquist coordinate, it looks like a point, right? So it, it looks like the point R is equal to zero um, and uh, on the equatorial plane, but if you actually take r to infinity and m, or if you actually take m to zero in the boyer linquist metric, you don't quite get the Minkowski metric in Cartesian coordinates. You get the Minkowski metric in ellipsoidal coordinates. Whereas when you work in Kirchhill coordinates, when you take m to zero, you do get the Minkowski metric in Cartesian coordinates. So the x and y and z coordinates that I'm showing here is what you would think of as your regular coordinate axis. But certainly, you can always transform to another coordinate axis where the shape will look different. So, yes. Yes, you're absolutely right. Cosine square theta, sorry. It's the same row square I had before. Uh, that's why they're like they're all square, so they're all positive. They can't they can't cancel each other. Yes. Good, good question. So you can go and you can calculate other curvature invariants. Like for example, you can calculate the point Triagon invariant, which is gonna be like the Riemann contracting into its dual. And you'll find that it diverges on the same place. Also, th this di only diverges with, when rho vanishes. So in boyer linquist coordinates, all invariants vanish when rho is equal to zero. I think that's true. <laughs> I'm thinking whether there's a proof of that. That you can definitely calculate it one by one, right? But anyway. 
related to That's right, that's correct. And in fact, once you go to higher than second order curvature invariance, like cubic curvature invariance or quartic curvature invariance, you can construct it from second order curvature invariance. And you can show that all second order curvature invariance, which are finite, <laughs> there's not that many. Well, in fact, there's only two in this case, uh, diverge here. So therefore, all the future ones also diverge. Oh, the high order ones. All right, so I'm not gonna turn around so nobody can ask any more questions. Um, <laughs> and I'm just gonna talk about geodesics for two minutes because this will set me up for tomorrow's lecture on extreme mass ratio in spirals. So I'm gonna leave this a little bit as an exercise for you guys, for you all. Um, so 1.3 geodesics. And for the purposes of here, we're going to be looking at uh, time-like uh, geodesics, so because we're interested in the motion of a black hole around the up, around a supermassive black hole. So you have, you know, the geodesic equation for the trajectory that looks like this. So this is the second derivative with respect to proper time of the trajectory is equal to the Christoffel symbol of your space-time contracted onto two four velocities. So this is a second order um, equation and it's a little bit annoying to, to compute in this particular form, but you can use instead, you can use the fact that the energy, which is defined as minus u alpha t alpha, the angular momentum, which is defined as u alpha, phi alpha, and this quantity I'm gonna call q, which is defined as u alpha, u beta, times k alpha beta, are conserved. So all of these are conserved. Plus you can use the fact that, um, you know, u mu, u mu, is normalized to write down equations for the motion of these objects that look like first order equations. So for R dot, you get, um, well, you get equations that look more or less like this. Uh, minus A, A, E tilde, sine square theta, minus L tilde. Plus R square plus A square quantity P over delta, where P here is defined to be E tilde times R squared plus A squared minus A L tilde. And you get similar equations for R dot, theta dot, and phi dot. These are interesting because these are first order equations for the trajectories, for, for your four velocities, for different components of the four velocity, which you can then solve on a computer much more easily. And it's also the basis for the evolution of extreme mass ratio in spirals. Right? So the homework for you guys is to compute what the right-hand side of each of these equations is by separating, by using these conserved quantities. And for extra credit, the homework is to prove that E dot L, sorry, uh, d by d tau of E tilde, d by d tau of L tilde, and d by d tau of Q is zero, exactly. And I'm not gonna be handing in solutions, but if you wanna show me the solutions, I'd be happy to look at them over. Or if you get stuck, feel free to ask me questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs>